work for the Forest Service. Um, so, I work out of St. Paul. Um, I heard a ring back, so I was to say the other. I work out of St. Paul up here. My land is right in this little corner of northeast Iowa. So some of my pictures that I'll throw in a few pictures from my land, um, it's my own outdoor laboratory. But my, in my job with the Forest Service is to have the big picture of forest health across the area and know what's going on in the forest. So I'm excited to share some of that with you today. I'm going to talk on a lot of different levels, um, some pretty basic to some more complicated, so hopefully there'll be something for everybody. And I apologize if, if some of it is too basic. Um, I'm going to start with a few simple definitions just so we, there's things that I talk about in here that I want to make sure we all understand the importance of them. So these are some of the topics I'm going to just real quick fly over. You know, the commonality of the three tree species I'm talking about today is they're all very important mass producers. You know, we got our, our walnut, hickory, and oak, very important for, for wildlife. So mast is seed, and hard mast is the nuts from the, you know, it, it lasts longer. So these are important hard mast species. I'm not going to talk about any of the pests that affect the quality of the nuts that these trees produce. I'm going to talk about the factors that affect the health of the trees so they produce the mast. And of course, you know, we value these three species. It's so much more than their nuts. It's, these are very important species for um, timber and wood products. So um, the other thing, next thing is normal. Normal as it relates to weather and climate, understanding what's normal. I'm not going to talk about climate change, but there are things that are outside of normal that really interact with our insect and disease problems. Um, drought is huge. Um, in some sites, flooding is huge. Uh, even the distribution of the rainfall and how long leaf surfaces are wet in the spring. So rainfall patterns and how the moisture comes, if they differ from normal, it can allow outbreaks of different disease problems. And cold extremes, some of our species are limited by cold extremes, and as that line shifts or as you have unusual cold events, it can really affect trees, which um, I'll, I'll be covering that in walnut. Okay, so just an example of, of drought, an example from 2012. This is July 3rd, 2012. This is, a, um, this is just a Palmer Drought Index map that I downloaded off the Midwest Climate Information Center website. I like to go look at these big pictures, these landscape things, to see where, you know, there helps you know what's going on. So even the beginning of the summer is fairly dry. Down here, D1, this tan is moderate drought. So it's already dry in July. By August that year, this um, red is extreme drought. So we're right here. So it was dry, and you go into September 4th, it was still dry. Um, October 2nd, still in drought. So a drought that lasts, it, it lasts that long and it's that intense is going to have impacts on your trees and it's not just going to be for that one year. Some of those drought impacts are showing up five years later. They're still persisting. And it's important to be able to look back and say, oh, that was the trigger event that started this whole process. Um, let's look at rainfall. Um, last spring. Um, this is the accumulated precipitation uh, from March to May. So spring season, last spring. This bar down here is, well, the, light, the moderate green to the dark blue, it, the moderate green is 100% to 125% of normal, which is the 30-year average, and the dark blue is 150 to 175. What this is telling us the, you know, all these darker blues and greens is that spring 2017 was a fairly wet spring. Um, 100 to 175 percent of normal throughout mo the area most of us are probably from. Um, so where are we at right now? Are we near normal? This, this is our, the, the, the winter we just finished and this uh, light 
green color here, it's somewhere between 75 and 125 percent of normal precipitation. We had a pretty normal winter when it was all said and done. It might not have, we might have picked some of it up at the end, but we had a pretty, pretty normal winter for precipitation and current drought conditions. This is where we're going, this is what we're going into, um, going into our growing season with, that most of our area is not in drought unless you're in southeast Iowa or Missouri and they're still suffering a bit of drought. So that's where we're at right now. Um, site, site quality, just wanted to mention that the quality of your site has a huge impact as well. And site quality is, um, you know, some tree species grow on good sites and won't grow on poor sites and some can grow on the poor sites so they'll compete better and do well on some of these poor sites. So knowing your site quality, texture of the soil, um, soil moisture pH, um, there's site quality can make a difference in these problems and then range. So trees have a natural distribution range where they were historically present before settlement, where they're climate adapted, where the seed sources are from. And I'll have some range maps that I'll throw in. Um, okay, let's get into talking about the trees. I'm gonna start with hickory. Um, so there's, in the, I'm thinking, where is it that it, I get the feedback? Is it when I, oh. When I, um, maybe I'll step to this side, I don't know. When um, the northern area, if you get into southern Illinois, southern Iowa even, there's a lot more hickories. But in the northern part of our drawing circle for this group, really we're dealing mostly with the shag bark and the bitter nut. And they're really quite different. Their leaves look pretty similar. Now our shag bark and our bitter nut but you can easily tell them apart by their bark and by their buds. The top one is your typical um, shag bark hickory, the um, papery layers, big fat bud. They almost look like a flower when they leaf out in the spring. And then the bitternut hickory, the little buds. And I don't know, I find so much more bitternut hickory coming in as an early successional species. And I see the shag bark on, diff they grow on different types of sites often. Um, of course, their seeds are different. Your, your shag bark is your coveted um, hickory nuts. Um, bitter nut is still valuable to animals, valuable for hickory nut oil, um, but not as coveted for human consumption. Um, but they also differ their, their sites. So this is where I said range maps. So in this gray, this is one of those historic, they call it Little's range map from the, early, the first historic record. These range maps are really valuable to see where the normal distribution of that species was. So um, shagbark hickory, it's widely distributed tree species, but up here we're at the northern end of shagbark hickory's range. And at this northern end, shagbark hickory is going to grow different than it would, say, down here. Um, in the northern portion of the range, it's often growing on upland sites, and of the hickories, it's considered a longer-lived species. Whereas the bitternut hickory, it's supposed to like the richer sites and riparian areas, but you also find it on the dry uplands. So we're pretty much, you know, we've, we're pretty well in the range of bitternut hickory. It's, it should be adapted to this area. So knowing these things tells you how well that tree should grow in your area. But fairly recently, there's, people have been observing a lot of hickory mortality, not just one tree dying. And so one of my colleagues worked with Dr. Jenny Joswick here in the middle. She's with the Northern Research Station, US Forest Service, and she did a research project on it to figure out what's going on when you have unusual mortality. It's not a simple process to really tell what's going on. You have to have ordered surveys, transects uh, through this forest, cutting down trees, looking at what's happening under the bark, taking samples. It can take years and thousands and thousands of dollars to do a study to figure out what's going on. We, the, we did this um, from 2000, we started in 2006 to 2008, and you can see the, the dots on there were some of the places we had plots, um, including, you know, this should be relevant information for us here because some of the plots were really in our area. Um, what she observed what the data they collected, there was a, a lot of the, the symptoms of decline were noted, which was 
small leaves, um, sparse or thin crowns. Um, flagging. Flagging is when a branch dies and it turns off color so it's like a flag in the canopy of the tree. So when I talk about flagging, it's a, a dead branch happening in the upper canopy of the tree. So there was decline, and, but there was also dieback that was happening where trees were dying back. You know, when there was damage on the main stem of a tree, um, where the stem was, the top was dying, there would sometimes be epicormic sprouts from the main stem as the tree's last gasp to try and stay alive, to keep that root system alive, putting out branches from the, the side. So they observed several types of damage. Uh, they observed insect damage. When I say HBB, it's hickory bark beetle. And in here you see some attack holes on the stem where hickory bark beetle attacked the, this, this tree. They, they found the damage was much greater on the bitternut hickory and the smooth bark hickories than the shag bark. The shag bark was doing fairly well. Um, these things can affect shag bark, but it was more a problem with the bitternut. Um, so they collected over 1,800 beetles, and over 85% were this hickory bark beetle. There was also some hickory timber beetle in, in there. Um, as for the disease agents, I'm mentioning this one first because on uh, 25 sites, they found it on uh, five of them. This is not the, the widespread problem, but when you walk onto a site, you might see these galls. They're very striking. They're usually not on all the trees. There'll be a, cert a few trees that have these galls. Um, yeah, they're out there, the Phlomopsis galls, but they aren't what's causing the death of the hickory. I mean, they might cause a death of a few trees, but they're not the landscape level death of trees. What she did find was there were different types of cankers. A canker is a dead spot under the bark. So, you know, under the bark, the growing surface of the tree is that cambium, the cambium layer that's producing, you know, that's where the tree's growing. When that is killed, the tree can't grow in diameter, can't produce um, water conducting tissues. That dead area is called a canker. Um, and she found two kinds of cankers. One was what we call more of a, a diffuse canker that the margin of it, the margin of the dead area under the bark was less distinct, or these annual cankers that the margin is very distinct. And the thing about these annual cankers, they're not spread as far, and they're over a period of years, and as the tree grows around that dead area, so the dead area ends up sunken as the tree grows out. Um, the pathogen associated with the more spreading, damaging cankers was Ceratocystis smallii. Ceratocystis, um, and it is an old pathogen, but it was newly named. Within the last 15 years, it got a name of its own and we recognized it, but it's been around a long time. And then Fusarium, you'll hear that one again. Fusarium was the second most commonly. Um, so through her research, she came up with this scenario of what's happening. We have a stressed BNH, bitter nut hickory, that's attacked by the hickory bark beetles and they're carrying, the ceratocystis is carried on the bottle, body of these bark beetles. And so even if the, the hickory bark beetle, the tree's healthy enough that it doesn't, it resists the attack by the bark beetles, um, it's introduced a fungus in there. And that fungus starts to form a canker under the bark. These cankers, if you peel back the bark of these dying trees, you'll see these dead areas under the bark where the hickory bark beetle has introduced the fungus and then it's causing damage. And that fungus, this wedge in a cut surface, you know, this is the cambium around the edge where it's dying. This was, would be a canker area. It's not just affecting that cambium. The discoloration is extending in a wedge into the tree and interfering with water movement. And that's why you get those canopy symptoms and you have your trees dying fairly quickly. A few of these get established and the tree starts to decline and then tons more of the hickory bark beetle attack and you end up losing your tree. So, um, yeah, the, the question then is management, what to do about it. And this is overall for your hickories. Um, you know, we're gonna tell you the same thing. Maintain diversity of species. Um, we're gonna tell you thin your overstock stands, take good care of your forests. Um, but there's some things you can't control. These mortality events, these hickory bark beetle attacks um, and, and this hickory mortality. It's usually triggered by a drought uh, or other stress. Um, so then you're left with what your response is. And if you have a high proportion of hickory in your stand, you'll probably be wanting to uh, do salvage to, to get the hickory out of there. And there's another benefit 
Now, I mentioned the pathogen is carried by the hickory bark beetle. And if you remove the trees from the site, if you salvage them, get them off site before those hickory bark beetle complete their life cycle, you're reducing the bark beetle populations too. So it can, but you gotta be fast on that one. You know, cutting standing dead after the bark beetles have already emerged isn't going to do anything to help reduce your population of bark beetle. But a rapid, a rapid salvage can help reduce your bark beetle population. Okay, let's talk about walnut a little bit. Um, so I said I'd talk about my own lands. This is, this is one of my walnut trees. We, we kind of like our walnut trees too. Um, I think I've probably got, do I have my own garlic mustard in there too? No. Um, I, I, I don't know if there's garlic mustard on that side. I know there's on other sides. So there's the, the black walnut and then our white walnut or our butternut. And so I'm going to just briefly touch on both of those. Um, you know, just the foliage. It's hard to tell them apart from the leaves. Um, can tell them apart, apart from the buds. Uh, chambered pith, you know, your typical walnut things, just to be familiar with knowing your trees. You all know your black walnut. Um, sometimes I can tell my butternut when I get in the woods. Well, there's the nuts. Obviously, the nuts are different. Um, the brown nuts for the walnut and the more oblong for the butternut. I'll come back to how you really tell them apart in the woods in a minute. Um, here's our, the native range of black walnut. Look here. This is the northernmost boundary of the native range of black walnut. We're getting kind of close to that. So if you're trying to grow black walnut near the northern range, you might have freeze events that damage your black walnut, and that is a problem for, for some black walnut growers. You have to be careful of your site selection. I will, I would be careful of where I planted black walnut in northern Wisconsin. Um, butternut has a, a broader range. You're not going to need to be quite so concerned with that. Well, not a broader range, but it extends more into our area. Okay, so let's talk about what's common on black walnut, what you see. One of the things you'll see is your black walnut leaves out a lot later than a lot of other species. And so some some people get a little bit worried in the spring. They go into their walnut stand and everything else is leafing out and the black walnut isn't. Oh my goodness, did my trees die? Well, just wait a bit, wait a bit. They're coming, hopefully. Um, but not only do they leaf out early, they often get leaf diseases and by the end of the growing season, they've lost most of their leaves from some of these leaf diseases. Now, leaf diseases usually if they're late in the season, they're not going to kill the tree. They're, but, but if they happen over and over again, they can shorten the growing season for the tree. They can stress the tree. But usually leaf diseases aren't our problem. With, they're common, but they're, we don't worry too much about them in black walnut. Besides, what could we do about them? Well, there's not a lot we could do, but there are a few things. OK, there's some cankers. Um, this is on my property, too. So I've watched this canker. I've watched this canker for over 20 years and it has not killed the tree. Um, it's, this is what we call a, a nectarial-like canker that it's from a single point, it just kills a little bit each year and it expands. It destroys the form, um, but up on the ridge, I don't care about the form on this tree anyhow, but it's been fun to, to be able to track the progress and see how some cankers don't kill trees. Those ones, like the nectaria canker, it usually kills or damages individuals, not populations. I don't really, worry too much about things that affect an individual. I worry about my populations of my trees. What's going to go across the landscape and kill lots of trees? Um, there is a canker on black walnut that will kill quite a few trees when you have an outbreak, and that's fusarium canker. I mentioned fusarium before. This is a picture from Missouri. In Missouri, fusarium's often near the, the base of the tree. Fusarium cankers, this fusarium fungus, is a lot of times associated with stress or wounds on black walnut. So wounds near the base of the tree or frost cracks. Um, a few years back, well, a few years back, there was outbreaks of this fusarium canker and freeze injury. A few years back is 15 to 20 years ago, probably 20 years ago, and I still remember it, um, that there was dieback and damage to black walnut because the black walnut in the drainage is the frost pockets at the northern end of the, end of the range, and this fusarium was associated with that. So how do you prevent damage to your black walnut? Um, well, be careful when you prune your black walnut. Prune during dormant season. Um, be careful with your pruning cuts. 
You don't want flush cuts that break into the tree's natural barriers. You don't want leaf branch tops. You want to be careful with your cuts to, to do proper pruning so you help the tree not hurt it. And you want to avoid cold air drainages and frost pockets with your black walnut. Oh, I talked about what you see. Let's talk about what you fear. You fear thousand cankers disease. This, um, I put out the pest alert on thousand cankers disease. Um, so TCD, it's been a big, this is a, this is a black walnut that um, got declined and is deteriorating from thousand cankers disease. I'll tell you where that tree's at when I get to the end. Um, so thousand cankers disease is caused by interaction between uh, a little bitty beetle, the walnut twig beetle, and a fungus, this Geosmithia morbida, this, is, this fungus, we didn't even know, it didn't even have a name until, you know, 10 years ago or so. Um, the insect is native to the southwestern United States, so it, is it an exotic? It's an exotic to the northeast or to the eastern U.S., um, but it's not exotic. Um, this fungus, the fungi in this group, uh, this is, yeah. It's just a pic, you won't see the fungus looking like this. As, these are microscopic pictures. Um, that group of fungi was unknown to previously cause disease. Usually they're insect pathogens, not tree pathogens. But it's called thousand cankers disease because the trees that are affected, it's death by a thousand cankers. So the beetle attacks and starts feeding under the bark and the fungus is on the beetle and it causes a dead area under the bark. And when there's lots of these dead areas, they coalesce and girdle the tree, kill the tree. So thousand cankers, it doesn't ring so much when I'm over here, okay. Thousand cankers disease was not even discovered in the east until 2010. The red, it's not like TCD is a big deal in all these areas, it's, that's a county level, that's not a point level map. So if you have a, a, a stand of trees with this thousand cankers disease, the whole county's gonna light up. So don't think that these areas, all the walnut are dying here. It's just showing you where it's been discovered um, and the initial year of discovery. So we don't have any TCD discovered, where are we, over in our area. Um, you know, this is the distribution of black walnut basal area. We worry about something that could come in and wipe out our black walnut. We worry, we worry a lot, um, but the picture on thousand cankers disease is an emerging picture that we've been looking really hard. You know, I mentioned this, this beetle, this walnut twig beetle. We can use a, a pheromone to um, capture it and we put out twig, walnut twig beetle traps and people have been looking for walnut twig beetle and we're not finding it in a lot of places. The places they have found it, other places in the east, some of those sites it's been there 20 years uh, some of those trees are recovering. They had a stress event and they died and now they're having some recovery. It's not um, sweeping through the population, killing all the black walnut. Um, so the, um, some of my research colleagues did an inoculation study where they take this fungus and they put it into a living tree and they see how the fungus grows in the tree. And they did that with this Geosmithia morbida. And um, they found it's a, it's a pretty weak pathogen. They have a hard time getting much more death than a water control. You know, they put in sterile water, they get almost as much death as they do from putting in the, the fungus. Um, so, plus, they keep finding this pathogen on other types of insects other than walnut twig beetle in other places. Some of these things, we're not saying all the places they're finding it because people would be alarmed by it. But what it's telling us is that the pathogen probably occurs on a lot of different insects and probably isn't the problem. Um, it's probably walnut twig beetle, and it may not be so great of an issue in the eastern United States in the native range of black walnut, unless the walnut's under stress. How am I doing on time? Okay, I'm getting there. Actually, I'm doing pretty good. I'm talking faster than I thought. I got 15 more minutes. All oh, right. What? Yeah.
I'm, I'm trying to stand in places where it doesn't give feedback. Um, okay, so I was going to mention about the thousand cankers disease. This, um, so where it has been a problem is urban areas, particularly out west, you know, Colorado is where it first blew up. That tree I showed at the beginning, that's out in Walla Walla, Washington. And it's plenty of moisture, not drought conditions, vigorously growing trees, and they're having some blow of, of thousand cankers disease. And if we're saying it's a stress-related problem, they shouldn't have it at that point. But the good news is they're, they're, they're playing and exploring with some integrated pest management solutions out there because the primary thing is that it's this walnut twig beetle that can respond to pheromone traps and be tra they might be able to dra trap out the population of walnut twig beetle or do other things, um, use insecticides. If you have a problem, they're working on tools that would be able to manage it in plantations. Okay, um, so management, what to do. Okay, this is just the overall list for um, walnut. Um, I mentioned select proper sites, maintain diversity of species thin. The air movement thing. I said we can't do much for leaf diseases, but if you have real tight growing conditions and a lot of humidity on your leaves, you might have greater leaf disease problems. So that might be something if you're, you might be able to reduce your leaf disease with good air movement in your stand. Um, and the, the, one I, the other one I added down here is monitor tree health for new problems. You're, you're monitoring your walnut. If you start seeing, being, having troubles, if you see something, say something. Okay, um, so let's talk a bit about butternut, the other walnut. It was never, never real abundant, but I always get questions on butternut. Um, it's caused by this fungus called Othionomonia clavigenti juglandaceae. So let's just call it, the, the researchers call it OCJ. Um, I just call it butternut canker. Um, so it is an annual canker. It kill, it's a canker again. And that's how I recognize butternut in the woods usually, is they're the canker trees, unfortunately. Um, it was first found in 67 um, in Wisconsin. It's throughout most of the range of butternut. A few years back, they were talking about listing butternut as a threatening endangered species. Now, butternut really is a species in peril. It was never abundant, but it really is at risk. Um, we know the pathogens introduced. It behaves as an exotic pathogen. It has a narrow genetic base, but we don't know where it came from. The host country, wherever it came from, it's not a problem there. And that's why it hasn't been found and described. Um, so, you know, quite damaging. The canker's beginning at even natural openings, like lenticels and leaf scars. Um, and then many cankers coalesce to girdle the trees. It's an annual canker. So each year, the tree does some healing against it. Um, that means some trees actually can survive with butternut canker, cankers on them, survive a long time. Um, and one of my colleagues just, I'm, this is a shout out to James Jacobs, he just finished his PhD on looking at butternut canker. And this, he gave me some of the, his slides to use and some of his information. And this is one showing, you've got really cankered trees in the wild and some that aren't cankers. And so what's going on there? An individual healthy next to a diseased tree? Well, is there resistance or is just the one tree got lucky? What's going on? And that's one of the things he was working on. So there is natural variation. And um, some of the things, he's still working on his publications, but some of the things are related to tree vigor, that a vigorous tree can overgrow and survive a long time with some of those cankers if it doesn't have too many of them. And there is some might be some heritability of resistance. Unfortunately, it's not as strong as we'd like to see. Um, so the heritability of resistance, resistant trees, is probably going to need to be combined with other factors to be able to help us with butternut. Um, we also know butternut readily hybridizes with heartnut or Japanese walnut. So some of the uncankered trees that they thought were resistant butternut, when they did the genetic test, they found they were natural hybrids. Um, that gives you some clues. Where did this beast come from? Perhaps it came probably, you know, Japan or Asia because their trees have resistance to it. Um, so what to do? Uh, again, maintain diversity of species, but really important. If you want butternut, you're going to have to have openings. Butternut will not grow in partial shade. It needs big openings. It's a silviculture problem as well as a disease problem. 
So you're going to have to have large group openings or clear cuts where you try and grow your butternut. Um, and healthy, fast-growing trees that have some resistance may survive the annual cankers. Um, we can't give you any resistant cultivars at this point. I don't know when we might be able to. There may be some hybrids out there, and you'll need to decide if you want to um, have that foreign genetics in your natural stand if you want to keep your butternut pure and dead, or if you want it to be um, contaminated with um, hybridization with Asian varieties and living. I, I don't know. That's a hard question. It's not one I'm answering today. Okay, let's talk briefly about oak because I had that 15-minute sign come up. You know, we think of our red oaks with our pointy leaves, our white oaks with the smooth lobes, but when it comes down to it, there's a whole lot more red oaks and white oaks, and it's kind of hard to... Uh, you can't talk about all of them as a block because they are so different. They're different in their ranges. They're different in the types of sites they grow in. They're different in what diseases affect them. Um, yeah. Here's a few range maps. I like these range maps. Here's red oak, Quercus rubra. Or, you know, we're in really good red oak country throughout the east. You know, we're well within the range. Same with our white oak, our bur oak. Here's another one. This one's the native range of pin oak. There's northern pin oak and there's pin oak. This is the pin oak. Um, we're really at the edge of the range. So if you've got pin oak and in your stand and you're up here, Maybe your pin oak will be stressed. Knowing what tree you have and where it is relative to its native range is helpful. Um, I don't know if he wants me to just switch to the other microphone. Is that bothering you guys, that feedback, or is it okay? It's okay, okay. Just ignore it. Okay, so there's also this whole range of pests. And some diseases and pests are outright killers. Oak wilt is one of the examples. And some are a bit more complicated. Um, so these are some of the things that are affecting our oaks right now. Um, you know, oak wilt disease, of course, and I'm not going to say anything more about oak wilt disease because I could talk for hours about oak wilt disease, and they won't let me um, today. Um, it's an outright killer, not related to decline, but then there's oak decline, then there's bur oak blight, oak tatters, or other herbicide issues, rapid white oak mortality, um, insect defoliation, all these different things hitting our oak, and they may be tied, all of these may also be connected to this oak decline, and that's what I hope to cover in the next few min minutes. Among your handouts was this um, quick guide that one of my, another one of my colleagues put together, and this is um, just really a, a nice little publication. So, yeah, that's our gift to you, enjoy. It'll tell you more about some of these things that I'm not gonna have time to tell you about. Okay, let's talk about decline, oak decline, symptoms of decline. Um, um, Slow growth, sometimes you can't tell it's slow growth till you cut down the tree and look at the rings. Um, sparse, undersized foliage, you know, little leaves, chlorotic, off color, um, premature turning in the fall, and dead branches in the upper canopy. You know, dead branches in the lower canopy, I don't worry so much about because those are naturally shaded out. But when I see dead branches in the upper canopy where they should be getting plenty of light, that's the oak to you know, oak decline and dieback, and that's more of a thing to worry about. So I want to talk about the, this whole model of oak decline. Over here on the, yeah, for you it's right. Um, you start with a healthy tree, and there's a bunch of different predisposing factors that predispose the tree to decline, and then there's inciting factors that start decline happening, and then you can have a tree actively declining. It can recover, not as common. Um, and then there's these contributing factors that come in and kill trees. They can't recover from dead, usually. Um, so let's talk about some of those factors, the predisposing ones. Some can be the density of your stand, your stocking, overstock management history. If it's grazed or if you've had a lot of wounds to the bases of the trees, um, many things. Genetic potential are the trees that you have. Do you have potential for those, do those trees have the potential to grow well on that site? Are they within their range? Are they suited to the site? Um, are they from the right provenance, or are they from a southern seed source that was planted on the site? Um, the site and the soil conditions, are you on a droughty site, or are you on a floodplain? And these trees have just gotten um, drenched for the last three years by floods. Um, or the age of the trees, okay? Predisposing factors. So if you have some of those predisposing factors, um, then you can have inciting factors come in. Now, defoliation by disease or insect, drought, herbicide effects, wounding, 
Wounding can be an inciting factor. I did a timber harvest in there, I thinned, but I wounded my trees. Um, and it, there's some branch cankers that can also be involved. So here's one of our, um, the threats that we think is at, at our doorstep, and it probably is, is gypsy moth. Eats lots of leaves, moving into some of our area. You know, when gypsy moth eats all the leaves off the tree, it doesn't kill the tree outright, but it does that multiple years in a row, and your tree will become stressed and die from something else. So we worry a little bit about gypsy moth. Some people more than others. And oak chatters, another one of our um, buzzwords, or our big um, emerging problems. You know, I'm fairly convinced that this oak tatters is usually caused by an herbicide issue. And so I want to go back to that one. The tatters here, it's missing intervenal tissue. So the tree is missing photosynthetic area. Um, and, you know, it can be pretty extreme and the trees leaf out again. Not a great picture, but it shows they flush again. That takes energy. Um, so the trees, even if they reflush and by the end of the growing season, they're, they're looking okay. If it has to do that year after year, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stress your tree. Um, and it can be the whole can canopy of the tree affected. I'm not going to say too much, anything more about tatters today here, but I am going to talk a little bit about some of these contributing factors. Okay, uh, two of our big notorious ones are armillary root disease and two-line chestnut borer, but there's other, there's other actors that come in and play that role. Um, so in this whole oak decline process, um, there's other actors that play the roles. So two-line chestnut borer. A lot of times when a tree dies from two-line chestnut borer, you'll see leaves still hanging on the tree. Um, yeah, trees dying over a period of years. Uh, it, what it's doing is, in a weakened tree, it's attacking the bark, and they're, you know, this beetle is laying eggs. The eggs grow into these larvae that are underneath the bark, and the water can't move up and down. And then this is an oak. This is an oak. Yeah. Two-line chestnut borer is mostly on oak. Well, it's on chestnut too, but um, yeah, it's a very common problem on, on oak, all species of oak. Um, contributing factor, another one is armillary root disease. And here, this is where the bark's peeled off of a root, and this white is the fungus growing in between the bark and the wood, killing that growing tissues. That armillaria is growing under the bark of the tree, killing the tree. Here, there's a dead tree chopped away the bark, and you can see the mycelial fans of the fungus underneath, underneath the bark. So sometimes our method of sampling, if the tree wasn't already dead, it's going to be by the time we get done sampling. So I want to give you a specific example of this rapid white oak mortality. Um, and now here's a shout out to Sharon Reed. This is from a seminar she gave a couple days ago, this picture. The, this is why they're worried about it. A lot of white oak dying in the drainages, um, mostly in Missouri is where she did her work. Uh, that we're observing a similar event on chestnut oak and some other areas, you know, in Indiana and stuff, localized, and trying to figure out what's going on. It takes a while to figure out what's going on. Uh, what she's came to the conclusion that the sites where this is happening, this white oak mortality, it's usually the lower drainages and the toe slopes, which it shouldn't be the droughty sites. Um, but there are areas where there's fluctuating soil moisture. There was some evidence of uh, another pathogen, Phytophthora root rot, in some of the sites, and that eats at the fine roots, so that may be a part of it. Um, but most of the things they found killing the trees were stress events. The thing, why it was called rapid white oak mortality is the trees would die quickly and deteriorate so quickly. And she's finding another pathogen in there that causes dead wood to break down quickly. It doesn't kill trees outright, but it breaks down quickly, and that might be one of the reasons that it looks like it happened so rapid. We don't know if it really is happening as rapid as it looks at it, like it is. Um, it's taking us a while to figure this one out. Uh, so here's a site in, in Iowa then that I was at for a site visit in 2017, declining trees. So this tree's still alive, but it won't be next year. You know, it was in the process of dying. And on that tree we found, these were, this was in August, I think this was in August. No, this was the beginning of September. And there was the fruiting bodies of armillaria starting to form at the base. Um, underneath the bark, there was two-line chestnut borer and some of the armillaria. So this tree was still alive, and it had a strip kill up of it, up the stem. Part of the stem was dead, and already had armillaria and two-line chestnut borer. 
So those in that whole decline thing, they're the contributing um, factors. Okay, we cut down those trees and, and looked at growth rate was low. So we looked at growth rate. Um, they were older trees. There were previous stressors. There was had been drought several years earlier. There's some tatters scattered throughout. Um, some twig cankers, jumping oak, a lot of different things nibbling at it, figuring out what's killing these trees. You know, our malaria and two-line chestnut borers coming in, but there's a lot of other things feeding into it. Um, and it's, it's kind of complicated. So the question is, is what we're seeing in Iowa, is it rapid white oak mortality? Or is rapid white oak mortality just oak decline that's moving really fast? Um, and then the burning question is, will it keep happening? And that's what we're trying to figure out. I think there's enough stress events that happen. Yes, we will keep having these events happen. Um, so my struggle is to figure out which things are primary causes and be predictive without being alarmist. Um, your struggle as a landowner is to recognize what's going on in your forest and know what's important and manage the right problems. And you know, I can't give you all the solutions today, but hopefully it gives you some information. You know, again, the management, what to do, you know, observe, watch, monitor. With oaks especially, don't prune in the spring. That's the oak wilt thing that I said I wouldn't say any more about. Um, species diversity, um, um, avoiding, avoiding the wounding and the soil compaction, those things are big. Those are huge, important to your stands. And also, let's not move things around. Let's not move our pests around, our gypsy moth, our oak wilt, our other things. Let's not move them around. Be careful when you're moving firewood and tools and nursery stock. Okay, so pulling it all together. I think you're ready for me to try and pull it all together. Okay, there's, you know, we got all these little threads, and we got to make a pattern out of it. Um, these things I talked to about today, most of them, they're pretty much related to stress. Um, and if you're understanding what's happening out there, you can respond appropriately to know when to salvage, to know, know what's going on in your forest, and, and good management. It really, it does help. It helps you avoid problems, salvage your value. Um, okay, now to any burning questions. That, that's where I was. I lit, that, I lit the match for that yesterday at noon. So that's a, that's a fresh fire. That's my goat prairie. Yeah. So yeah, I do enjoy getting out of my classroom. But now I can answer questions about oak, walnut, and hickory problems. The question was walnut twig beetle. Is there a northern range to it? I would think the what they're seeing, the northern range would probably be the northern range of black walnut. So it's kind of moot. But it is an insect from the from the southwest. How is the herbicide getting to the white oaks? Well, um, the, 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 <laughs> you want to get me fired? <laughs> no, no, the herbicide to the white oaks, um, I, I really believe that the tatters could be the, that one specifically could be the chloroacetamide herbicides, and they volatilize and it's a cloud. And so it, it's not straight up drift, it's that it, it because of the way that you know, volatilizes in the air, there's just, it's just present at, at low concentrations and sometimes higher concentrations in agricultural areas. Yeah, and it can go deep into the stands. So as for the, the leaf impact, um, the White Pine Hollow isn't too far from here. And several years ago, um, Iowa DNR, we were looking at trying to figure out this and they, you know, they bagged some leaves bagged some shoots and you know looked at some of this whether the impacts were direct in, you know contact and yeah it does seem that the bag leaves were not affected so yes it something is coming in contact and there's also the question of uh, why are white oaks so susceptible and there there's something in the physiology of white oak and the timing of when the these um, these chemicals are present that the white oak is particularly susceptible it's not a fungicide, it'd be an herbicide, and I'm not sure how they're applied. I think a lot of it's ground application. I, I, it would all depend on what they were, what they were spraying. For instance, um, gypsy moth, there's aerial application of the gypsy moth pheromone that is bound to little flakes, and what they're dropping out of the airplane is um, little flakes of plastic that have a, an attractant to, for the gypsy moth male moth, and it confuses the males so they can't ever find the females. And now that is not going to affect your, that's only helpful to your oak. That's not going to cause any damage. So you have to know what they're spraying out of the plane, whether it's, you know, if it's a, a 
Gypsy Moth um, Slow the Spread project. Oh, that? No, I don't know about the corn herbicides. Yeah. The, the, how do you diagnose our malaria for sure? Um, if you have a tree, well, for one thing, our malaria can come in secondary on trees that have died from something else. How I diagnose it is cutting through the bark and finding those white mycelial fans under the bark or the mushrooms. Um, there are some people do cultures or genetic testing to, to detect. Yes, for sure, that's our malaria. It's at the base of the tree. It, it, it's at the base of the tree, and then after the tree's dead, it can go up higher. It can go, you know, you can find the fungus growing under the bark eight, ten feet up the tree. Is there anything you can spray on it and kill it? Our malaria, is there anything you can spray on it and kill it? No. No. There's nothing you can spray on it and kill it. But it's not something that's going to go out and kill your trees unless they're already stressed. Um, I do know that white oak are particularly susceptible to whatever's causing this. Um, you might not be able to grow white oak on in those areas. And I don't want to have to say that because I love white oak. It's our state tree in Iowa. Okay, two-line chestnut borer is a native insect. So um, it's an agrilus beetle. It's the same um, genus as emerald ash borer. You know, they're both agrilus. They, you know, both of them will have D-shaped emergence holes and they kill under the bark. The thing is, um, two-line chestnut borer is a native insect and it's in balance usually with our, our trees, and um, emerald ash borer is an exotic and our trees have no resistance. So if you have two-line chestnut borer, it's usually coming in on stressed trees or there's a drought or a stressed event. And usually we don't give a lot of recommendations for that, but it is also a bark beetle. And so this idea of sanitation, in some places people do sanitation, that if they have two-line chestnut borer outbreak, they try and harvest and destroy the infested wood before those beetles can emerge to reduce the, the population. Um, it's under the bark. Um, spraying insecticides is, you know, it, that's not a solution for two-line chestnut borer. If you're talking about injections, it's already it's in trees that are already stressed. They're not going to, you know, they already have a primary problem of being stressed. So it's not something you spray to prevent. I wouldn't expect if you're using limited quantities. The question was about spraying garlic mustard in the woods. And um, I caught the end of the talk before mine where the gentleman was talking about shrub treatments. And there's, you know, there can be a level that um, you, you reach a maximum level where it's damaging your, your trees. But if you're properly treating your garlic mustard, it's a different type of treatment than this volatilized um, ag herbicide usage. So um, I, I guess I would say probably not. Probab taking care of garlic mustard with herbicide probably isn't. I personally like to kill it with a flamethrower myself because I get more personal satisfaction when I torch it. But, um,